<laughs> okay. Um, can everybody see this? Apparently, the wall is the screen. I have been here. I've, we've been in this building 15 years, and I have never been in this room before. Um, okay, so just a couple things in terms of format, the way the course, um, the way the course I'd like it to run. You got an email from me last week with the code for Top Hat. If the, what the company told me was, if you purchased Top Hat, a year-long subscription, then it'll automatically kick in. The, the, there's a slight difference in the book. They had some more animations and stuff, which is why I told them to go ahead and load that up for this for this semester. But um, I've given you access to all the chapters there, um, so you should have access to all the chapters. And then I'll go back at the end of the semester and give you access to the. Well, if I haven't, the, I think I might have given you the previous chapters as well as just review. So you should be able to use the whole book, even if this is the first semester you're using the book. Um, and of course, if you have another textbook, Wade, then it's pretty similar in terms of format. But you need the electronic book so you can do the problems within it. Um, so the way I've laid out this, way, the way I've laid this out is um, on Canvas is that we, it looked like all of you were in the system, so if you didn't, you know, if you didn't take lab last semester, if you did, you know about Piazza. Piazza is going to be the um, is going to be the online discussion board that's an anonymous. I set that up so that um, it is should be ready to go, although it doesn't. From here, you have to log in. Um, but it's there so that you can go in and ask questions and then I'll answer them. The six posts are not questions. You can do this. You can also post during class. I'll have it up. So if you don't want to ask a question, you can type it in and, um, and ask, ask questions. You could ask beforehand. I may start with if you have any questions, you know, put them on Piazza or ask. You can always ask. That's not a big deal. But if you feel squeamish about asking, you can just put it up there and I will answer the questions. Um, so, and that's that's anonymous, so half the time I don't even see whose name is associated with it. If you post anonymously, you're totally anonymous. I have no idea who you are. So I guess that makes it a judgment-free zone um, for you to be able to do that. The the way we're going to work this is you have the um, syllabus of the topics we're on the, in the back of the syllabus. You have the reading schedule. And we're going to follow that reading schedule day by day. So, for instance, there's really two parts to all kinds. We're going to talk about part one today. And then we're going to um, talk about part two on Wednesday. So for Wednesday, what I would like you to do is to... Um, go through and yeah, there's a video there's going to be a video for each for most of the topics there might be a video place where there's not a video so for instance if I go to and if you look at this there's all sorts of things on here there's um, how to play the how to play the the uh, answer keys um, the narrated answer keys that you'll see for problems there's the reading list is here, so it's always online. And then older exams from both first semester and second semester. And then for today, for instance, the reading assignment, so that if you clicked on that, it would tell you, okay, here's the here are the topics that we're going to talk about today. So we're going to actually talk about um, probably the first, these first ones. As a, and then we'll get to those with the rest of it on Wednesday. So that's the reading assignment. That's the topics assignment. Now, it's up to you what you would like to do from there. You can read the book if you would like. Um, but there are also lecture videos to go with this. The lecture videos have been, um, there's a table of contents. So once you go to YouTube, it'll tell you, okay, if you want to see this section, go to this timestamp, go to these timestamps. 
Um, so for instance, for today, if you wanted to, if you want the copy of the lecture notes, they're there. If you wanted to watch the video, you can go here. Um, we won't. So for instance, the physical properties are for the beginning to three minutes, then naming them three minutes to seven minutes, and then structure and bonding, and then show more. The stuff we're going to talk about today is um, formation and reactions, and then preparation. So really, each topic I've tried to, to put that to make it clear what part of the video covers that part because there may be some extra stuff in the videos um, so you can go right to it so it's up to you what you want to do do you want to read only do you want to watch the video and then go back and look at the problems in the top hat textbook or do you want to do both I mean it's I, I understand there's a time issue here if you wanted to do both but if you're if you're okay with reading that's fine if you want to see the video, then you can just focus on basically this last, um, that's about 21 minutes of that. So for each one of the days, there's going to be a video, and then there's also the section so that you can do, so you can watch the video if you'd like, or you can read the book, or you can do both. So that's, that's the way I'm going to assume that um, it's going to um, that you're going to get the information. And then, of course, you can ask. We'll start. We'll start with, you know, what kinds of questions you have. Okay. So that's how that's how we're going to the structure things. And then in here, we're going to do problems, answer questions, um, and so if you if you don't quite understand something, that's a perfect thing to ask on Piazza. You know, ask, can you go over this in lecture? When you come in, hey, I don't get this, and I'll go over it. And anything I don't get to, I'll, record, I'll probably just record a video and put it either on Piazza. I'll put it on Piazza after class if I don't get to things. So that's, that's sort of the way the classroom is flipped. But there are videos that go with it, and it's much more structured. Um, I had this, this part much more structured for second semester. Um, there are also some, you can't see here, but there are some problems that I may assign, um, as well as practice problems. You, you won't see this because it doesn't have the green circle. That's, I'll add those things in as we go. So right now, this is up through for, uh, beginning of February until after the first exam. Okay. So that's how we're going to, that's how we're going to structure, um, that's how we're going to structure the class. Now, as far as the syllabus goes, you can read through the syllabus if you haven't already. There was only one change that I made to the syllabus, and that was um, I forgot about the CAS professional development, which I'm sure you're going to be required to do either for your major, um, well, probably for the major, any of those majors. Um, as far as the um, as far as the as far as the syllabus, uh, the important parts of the syllabus, we're having four exams this semester. At the end of last semester, when you started to talk about reactions, that's where we pick up. So this semester goes at what appears to be a much quicker pace because we'll be learning sometimes three or four or five or ten reactions a day. So um, that's it. That's why um, we're going to have four exams to break it up more evenly. There will be, if you look at where it says assessment of student learning, um, we're going to have low stakes assessments and we're going to have high stakes assessments. The exams, there's four exams, there is a multiple choice. ACS final exam, but let's get through the first couple of months here before we worry about that. Um, when that time comes, there are study guides in the library. Um, I believe you can even purchase and do an online test, and but that's um, you can go to the ACS Exams Institute. We'll talk more about that. As far as the formative assessments, which are little quizzes um, along the way. At some point, we will start class with a quiz on last time's material. 
so that that way you can keep up um, with reactions. I didn't do that. I haven't done that as much in the recent past, but we're going to go back to that. I will give the graded electronic homework problems in Top Hat, which I would ask you to do before class. If you don't get to them, that's fine. They'll I'll tell you exactly when I'm going to go through and, and look at those. Those are graded on participation. So if you miss something, okay, you can go back and answer it. You have unlimited number of guesses to get it right. But remember, this isn't just a checkbox. This is an opportunity to see if you understand that. And if you're missing a question or if you miss the if you have to just randomly guess to get it right, that might be something you want to ask about. Um, and then the, I will provide you some graded homework problems that you will answer and turn in. Sometimes I will just go through quickly and make sure that people have attempted them. Other times I will go through and grade them explicitly. You will not know. Actually, I will probably not know either. So um, you want to, and again, that's an opportunity if something doesn't make sense. Okay, I, I need to look at that. So the ACS exam will be at the end of the semester, but like I said, we'll, it'll be totally comprehensive, but we will do um, our best to make sure you review as we go through this semester. Uh, on Friday, the um, professional development, the career services is going to come in and give you a brief overview of how to complete the assignments. If you didn't get a chance to complete your resume and your cover letter assignment from last semester, um, I would get that. I would try and get that done since for most people the summer is coming and internship. You want to have a good resume and cover letter ready for your internship possibilities. If you did that, then you're fine. Um, the deadlines for those are well before the end of the semester because Career Services basically told me that they couldn't operate on a week, a week to get me all the information. So the two things they wanted to do was an earlier deadline so that we can, so they can tell me who's done what. But then also they want to come in and just make sure everybody heard exactly where all the places to go for that information are. So they're going to do that on Friday. I don't, it, it's not going to take the entire period. They said a, a few minutes just to go through that. Um, the rest of it, you can go ahead, the rest of the syllabus, you can go ahead and read on your own. Okay. Any questions? So exams will not be multiple choice. Exams will be written out. And if you want to see what the exams look like, like there's 10 years worth of old exams online um, for you to take a look at. Okay, so where did my screen go? How are we going to start? What are we going to start with? Well, let's start with the following. Alkynes. A carbon-carbon triple bond. So the question is, I would like, the, w the way all these functional groups work is that the textbook, well, the textbook actually won't talk about naming them because we did naming last semester way back in the first, you know, in the first month or so. But we're going to talk about structural properties of the functional group, some physical properties if that's appropriate. Then we're going to talk about how to make that functional group, and then the reactions of that functional group. That's the way every functional group is set up. So to this point, you know about alkanes and alkenes, and that's it. Well, with alkanes, there was a lot of stuff, chirality, SN1, SN2, and we're going to go back and review that. And to help you review that, you have the review problems that will help you go back and review that. And that's due not this Friday, but next Friday. And I've given you the Scantron form to, um, to go ahead and put your answers on. So hopefully by the time you're done with that, most parts of Organic One will be fresh in your memory. And if you have any questions, you can ask. I'm not going to specifically work those problems, but I'll tell you where to look. Okay, so that's, that's why I've given those problems. I will be honest, I looked through the final exam and some of the questions that were missed the most. 
are not directly on there, but they're related to it. So that's where I started. And then I'm like, well, we need to remember Newman's, we need to remember chairs. For those of you who are coming in from Dr. Kwan's class, if something doesn't make sense, come and ask. Um, and you can look on the syllabus, you can schedule an appointment through the youcanbook.me website or come in during office hours. So, so the idea here is those are gonna help you review and get back up to speed. We didn't have a long break for you to forget everything, but my experience is it doesn't take very long for it to disappear. We gotta get it back in here. So triple bond. First thing that we want to talk about with a triple bond is there are two ways to make triple bonds. One is cheating. And by cheating, what I mean is that there are two types of alkynes. There's what is called an internal alkyne, and there is a terminal alkyne. The terminal alkyne is the one where the H is on the end, and then an internal alkyne is one where there are two alkyl groups on the end. Which begs a question. Okay. And bless you. Usually I use usually I've used the clickers. I had this laying on my had these things laying on my desk from um, conference I went to in Dayton uh, over the summer. So what you do with this is you want to fold it lengthwise and widthwise. Okay. So if you if you want to do that, bring these to class. Um, it's easier for me to use these and clickers because unfortunately for clickers it's like if there's two 37s they cancel each other out, but these won't. So you got to fold them so that way, when you have it, you can answer anything. You can answer any way you want by just simply folding it and saying, I want B, or I want D, or I want A or C. Okay? So that's how we're going to use those. I think they may, you may have used these. I think Dr. Zapparito had a set of these from another conference he went to. Because here is question number one. Question number one is, Internal or terminal alkyne, which one is more stable? The internal or the terminal alkyne, and I will give you A and B. And for all of these questions, I will give you an opportunity to discuss with a neighbor, and then you can go ahead and answer. So I'll give you 30 seconds or so. Which one is more stable? And then when you want, you can go ahead and give me your answer. <coughs> Hold up the answer. Okay, I see all A's. Now, why? Why is the internal more stable than the terminal? Um, electron density with the alkyl groups. Okay, it has more alkyl groups. What did we say? Where did we see this before last semester? Did we see a multiple bond last semester that may or may not have been more or less stable, depending on the number of alkyl groups that we had? It's just have to do with how substituted it is. It's how substituted it is. More substituted more stable. Where did we see that last semester? We've only done two functional groups, alkanes and alkenes. Alkenes. 
right? Double bond, the double bond was more stable, the more alkyl groups that attached to it, right? If we want to review more, we could say, why was that important? Because when we were form, when we were doing Saitsev's rule, Saitsev's rule said you formed the alkene that was most stable, most substituted. So a triple bond's no different. As a matter of fact, all the reactions we'll talk about on Wednesday of a double bond, with the exception of one or two, are exactly the same as alkenes. The only difference between an alkyne and an alkene is I got two pi bonds instead of one. That means I can add twice as much stuff. So if you remember last semester, we could add two BRs. Now I could add four BRs. I could add two H's. Now I can add four. So a triple bond is just an extension of a double bond. So more substituted, more stable. Exactly like last semester. Okay. Now, I would like to take this in cheating. Here's what I would like to do. I would like to take my, al my terminal alkyne. I would like to add a base to it. And I would like to turn that alkyne into what is called an alkynal anion. Okay, an alkynal anion... then I can do reactions with. So my question is, what kind of base should I use? To do that deprotonation. But before we get to that, we need more review. So the more review we need is, here's my periodic table, C, N, O, F. Which one, which way does basicity go? In other words, is a CH3 minus more or less basic than an F minus? Which way does basicity go on the periodic table? Does it increase from left to right, or from right to left, or left to right? So, in terms of increasing basicity, does it increase from right to left? Does it increase from left to right? What do you think? You're voting? <clears throat> we need some discussion first. Uh, okay, I see always. So C minus is stronger than F minus. You will see on the review questions that there is a question with periodic trends for basicity, um, simply because that was something that at the end of the semester kind of escaped people. All right, so the only question is, so this is a C minus. Now, a C minus with a triple bond is not a C minus like CH3 minus. We'll talk in the next few weeks, we'll talk about C, a CSP3 hybridized C minus is really strong. It's the strongest base that we have. But a triple bond C minus is approximately the same as, let's say, an O minus. So, and I'm not, and I won't get into the reasons for that. You can look at the textbook, but a C, a triple bond of C minus is approximately the same as an R O minus. So, therefore, the next thing that I need is I need to know then what bases can I use to form that alkyl anion. So, if you know that the triple bond C minus is approximately the same 
as an O minus, can you suggest some bases that I could use to make the C triple bond minus? So what should that be? I'll give you a minute to discuss and then somebody can suggest some bases. Okay, do we have some ideas? NH2 minus. Does that sound like a good one? Yeah. NH2 minus. What if he's wrong? Any others? Why'd you choose NH2 minus? Uh, it's a video. <laughs> okay. That's not a real answer. That's okay. So what do I need? What kind of base do I need generally? I need a base. This base must be stronger than this base. Okay. So in other words, the base... You could, you could view this reaction as an equilibrium, right? We could say, okay, once I deprotonate the alkynyl anion and I make my BH molecule, the alkynyl anion could go back and deprotonate the BH and reverse the reaction. So if we look at this as an equilibrium, what I need is I need this base to be stronger than this base so that that way the equilibrium is pushed towards the weak side for equilibrium Whenever you have an equilibrium, it'll always reside on the side that's weaker, the weaker base, the weaker acid. So in this case, I need a base that's stronger than an O minus. So I look, I go back to my periodic table. What's stronger than O minus? N minus and C minus. So N minus and C minus are stronger. And so NH2 minus is the base that we used in my class last semester as one of the two sterically or one of the two strong bases. This was not sterically hindered. It's a small base. You may have used in Dr. Kwan's class, you may have used something like LDA. Um, LDA is a nitrogen with two isopropyl groups with a negative charge on it. Now that is a strong base, but it is sterically hindered. So in order to get the strong base, but not the sterically hindered, we use NH2 minus. So I could use NH2 minus, or what else could I use? I could use NEC SP3 hybridized C minus. So I could use CH3 minus. And we'll, we'll become more familiar with those reagents because those are called Grignard reagents. We'll, we'll get more to, into that in the next chapter with alcohols and making alcohols. So in this case, I could use NH2 minus or I could use like CH3 minus. Either one of those is going to deprotonate this terminal alkyne and make an alkyne oil. Okay. And notice I'm, I'm mixing in here review. So if you're going through there and you're like, I have no idea what he's talking about, that's something you need to, need to look at, either in Top Hat. You all have access, I believe, to last semester's Canvas site. If you don't, I can get, give it to you. 
um, or you need to need to come in and ask. So we all get up to speed. So this is a cheat. This is the cheating method of making an alkyne. What you do is you take a terminal alkyne, you deprotonate it. Okay. Great. So I now take my terminal alkyne and I turn it into an alkynal anion. What is the alkynal anion? What would we call that? We would call that a strong it can it's a strong nucleophile. Now my definition of strong nucleophiles is that it has a negative charge, but a Cl minus, while it's a strong nucleophile, it's not a strong, what else goes with this? So strong nucleophile, but this is also a strong base. If it is the equivalent of an O minus, it also can be a base. So a nucleo so an al alkynal anion is a strong nucleophile, it's also a strong base. Okay. Now which is which is it gonna do? Well, my, my ultimate goal here is to turn this alkynal anion into another alkyne. So what I would like to do is I would like to take that alkynal anion once I make it. And I would like to add it to an alkyl halide, let's say with a different alkyl group here, which is, we'll call that R1, so that what I can do is now I can add a different group and I can turn it into a terminal alkyne. Water review. So my next question is, what kind of alkyl halide will do this reaction? And your choices are primary, secondary, tertiary, and we'll leave it at that. So, in order to do this reaction, what kind of alkyl halide do I need to do I need to use? Take a minute, discuss, and what I'm probably going to do is ask you one by one. Okay, so I need to know which alkyl halides I can do this with. My question is going to be yes or no, yes, A, B, no. If I use a primary alkyl halide, will I get this reaction to occur? A, yes, B, no. Primary plus that alkynyl anion. Will it, will it produce that product? Yes or no? Okay, I see all but a couple, yeah, I see all yeses except a couple no's. All right, how about secondary? Will a secondary do this reaction? Yes, no. A couple of no's, but mostly yeses. C, triple, uh, tertiary halide. Will a tertiary halide do this reaction? 
Yes, no. I see a hundred percent no's. Crowd startled down. If a tertiary halide, when it reacts with this, if it will not do this reaction, what will it do? You all said no. So what will it do instead? E2? Do we agree with that? How do you know it'll do an E2? Well, okay. So let's let's talk about let's talk about whether it will do well let me ask another question. If you said that for primaries and secondaries this reaction will go, what mechanism was that? SN2. So our choice here is either SN2 or E2. That's our choice. Now, for those of you from last semester, we made a chart. I will redraw that chart and I will put it in the folder for today. But here's what we know. This can act as either a strong nucleophile or a strong base. It has both characteristics. The question is, when will it do what? That's going to totally depend on this halide. So if that halide, want, the, the preference of this, and I give molecules human characteristics all the time, even though they don't have them. I say that molecule, first. its first instinct is to act as a nucleophile. If it can, it will. If it can't, it's going to get angry and it's going to go in and it's going to rip a beta hydrogen off and do E2. Okay. So in this case, primary and secondary halides, can they undergo SN2? Yes, because they're not that sterically hindered. So this with a primary or secondary halide, this alkynyl anion, We'll do SN2 all day long. But when it's tertiary, what happens? Tertiary halides are too sterically hindered to undergo SN2. You could say, but what about SN1? This is too reactive. It's not going to wait. It's, gonna not, it's not going to wait for the halide to form a tertiary carbocation. It's either going to add or it's going to deprotonate. So tertiary halide does not, it will not react SN2. So this will then do E2. So if we take that halide and we react it with a tertiary alkyl halide, it will undergo an E2 mechanism. And you will get over here an alkene. When I write low, can everybody see the, can everybody see here? Should I just limit my writing to the top half? Those of you in the back. Okay. If it's not, tell me. Because I can't move the projector at all. So this would be an SN2 reaction. That would be an SN, or that would be E2. So with alkynyl anions, we have a choice. We can either, if we want to make another alkyne, we use an alkynyl anion and we do what is called, this is called an alkylation reaction. It's called an alkylation reaction because I'm adding an alkyl group to the molecule. That's alkylation. So this is a way of cheating of synthesis. Remember, the overall goal here is how do I make a triple bond? Well, the cheating method to make the triple bond is to start with a triple bond, deprotonate it, alkylate it, I got a triple bond. But to me, that's cheating. Because I already had a triple bond to start with. I want to make a triple bond from scratch. Well, I've got to figure that out as well. 
right? So we have to go back and we have to remember when will when will a strong nucleophile react and do SN2? When will it do E2? And we're going to find out that these types of anions that are both strong nucleophiles and strong bases, and the two major kinds are alkynyl anions and also alkoxides, that if they can do both, they're going to do SN2 with primaries and secondaries. They're going to do E2 with tertiaries. Which leads to an issue of what kind of double bond do you form? The most stable or the least stable? But we'll get to that. Okay. All right, everybody with me? And if they're not, you just have to ask. And normally I won't do this much lecture, but if you didn't watch the video for today, which I didn't tell you to do then, but afterwards you want to kind of either read the book, watch the video to get caught up on this, and then, do, then read the video or watch the video or read the book or both for Wednesday. Okay, so everybody's okay with that. Um, Let's talk about how to make a triple bond from scratch. How do you make a triple bond from scratch? Well, in order for me to make a triple bond from scratch, I need to remember how to make a double bond. Let's see, we just said E2, right? E2 is a way to make a double bond. What do I need with an E2 reaction? I need a halogen. How about a bromine? And then if I have my leaving group as, with the bromine, what hydrogen do I lose to make the double bond? What kind of hydrogen? Greek letter. A beta hydrogen. So this is the alpha carbon. And then this would be an example of the beta. So I need a beta hydrogen. Let me take that back. OK, so I need a beta hydrogen. Okay, more review. What's the relationship between the beta hydrogen and the bromine have to be for an E2? They have to be anti-periclanar. Okay. Now, you just said, but you didn't write it that way. I have an acyclic system. I can rotate it if I wanted to. But, it, but they have to be anti-periclanar. My point here is alpha, we need a leaving group on the alpha carbon. We need a hydrogen on the beta carbon to make a double bond. What do I want to make? A triple bond. So I need to do how many E2 reactions to make a triple bond? Two. So I need a second bromine. I need a second hydrogen. Now, I got two options here. I could say, hey, let's put the bromine here. Let's put the hydrogen there. And now my base would come in and remove the first beta hydrogen, kick off the bromine to form the double bond. And then the base would come in, grab the second beta hydrogen, kick off the bromine to form the triple bond. So what I need is I need two halogens, two beta hydrogens to make a triple bond. But do they have to be like this? And this is called a geminal system. This is a geminal dibromide because both bromines are on the same carbon. That's geminal. Is that the only way to make a triple bond? No. I could say, how about I put the bromines on two adjacent hydrogens or two adjacent carbons? So that that way, my base 
My first equivalent of base could come in and grab that hydrogen and then kick the bromine off. I know it's not antiperiplanar, but again, it's an, ac it's an acyclic system. And then my second equivalent of base could come in, grab this hydrogen, and kick that bromine off. So do my bromines have to be attached to the same alpha carbon? No, they do not. Instead, they could be what is called vicinal. They could be a vicinal dibromide, which means that the two bromines are 1, 2. Well, I don't know yet how to make a geminal dibromide. The problem with geminal dibromides is they have to be made from triple bonds. So if I need a triple bond to make this, to make this one, to then make a triple bond, it's not from scratch. I do know how to add two bromines to carbons next to each other. And you do too. So this is where we'll pick up. We'll pick up quickly with this. What I'd like you to do for Wednesday is go back and review this, the first part here, and then the reading assignment, the videos, or book, or both. Um, and then if you can try the problems, if there are problems that don't make sense or anything doesn't make sense, put it up on Piazza. I will either answer it or we will go over it at the beginning of class on Wednesday.